It's no secret that real estate is one of the best investment vehicles out there. But how can we determine which strategies will best align with our financial ambitions? Well, you've come to the right spot. Whether you're an active real estate entrepreneur, a passive investor, or looking to get into real estate investing, our goal is to provide investors with the insights and strategies for building our portfolios all while protecting our capital. I'm Daniel Nichols, and this is the Two Smart Assets Real Estate Investing Podcast. Are you looking to grow your real estate investing business? Fortune Cribs can help. Fortune Cribs helps investors buy short-term rentals in select markets around the country for as little as 10% down with cash on cash returns in the 20 to 30% range. Fortune Cribs will design, furnish, and manage all the day-to-day -day operations, making your experience truly hands-off. And it doesn't matter where you're at in your real estate investing journey, whether you're trying to get your first deal or scale your portfolio, Fortune Cribs can help. So if you want to take the next step, go to fortunecribs.com and book your free consultation to see how Fortune Cribs can best help you. Once again, that's fortunecribs.com. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Daniel Nichols, accompanied by our guest for the week, Keely Hubbard. And today we are the two smart assets. For those not yet familiar with Keely, she is a real estate and agriculture investor and syndicator, as well as a sales coach for women business owners. Throughout her career, her primary focus has always been helping others achieve their life goals and is a managing partner of Hubbard Capital Group. Integrity, exceptional communication, and delivering results to investors are at the core of every decision she makes. And as a passive investor myself, I absolutely love to hear that. Keely, it's great to see you again. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I've been waiting for this and I'm really excited. Yeah, me too. Definitely excited to speak with you. You know, it's always a good conversation. Um, so, you know, we like to kick the show, show off by hearing more about you, the guest, Keely. So let's just start there, dive into it for us. Tell us more about your background and your story. Yeah. So I, um, I left corporate. I escaped corporate is what I like to say. <laughs> I escaped corporate about... Oh gosh, four and a half years ago now. And um, I was VP of sales for a company out of California. It was in the financial education space. So been in sales for 17 years. Um, the last kind of decade of that was really focused in the financial education space. And that's really where I developed a passion for helping people take control over their financial situation and not just leaving it to, you know, the results or their their life savings at the hands of Wall Street. So I did that for a very long time, uh, grew a company to a couple hundred million a year and uh, as VP of sales. And then I said, I'm done with this. And I left and people thought I was crazy, but <laughs> I just got, you know, I got tired of building somebody else's empire. And I really wanted to get back to my passion, which was helping business owners and coaching salespeople. So when I left, that gave me the opportunity to go into business with my father. Um, my dad's been a serial entrepreneur his whole life. Uh, he's a hedge fund manager, financial market trader. So I've been surrounded by this financial world for a long time. And because I had free time on my hands now, um, I could go into business with my dad. And that's really how we kicked off and started Hubbard Capital Group. We wanted to start moving our investors into hard assets because the financial markets just weren't, they weren't cutting it anymore. We couldn't get the same returns. And my dad's pretty good at kind of foreseeing what's happening and getting us into another asset. Um, before things do, you know what, before it hits the fan. <laughs> so that's how we got into, into uh, multifamily and now Texas Vineyards, like you mentioned. Yeah. So I think that's awesome. And, you know, you, so your previous experience, you know, working a job being a VP uh, has really probably helped a ton, you know, kicking off your own stuff, especially in the family business. And I'm always intrigued by family businesses because, uh, you know, just from many people that I've talked to working with family can be very difficult, you know, challenging at times, but it seems like you guys, you know, I've been following you guys for a while now, you guys have been very successful and you're doing some, some pretty awesome things. And, uh, so tell us more, just a little bit more about the focus of Hubbard Capital Group. I know you guys do multifamily and doing some other interesting stuff. So can you just dive into that for a second? Yeah, definitely. You know, any investment that we look for, whether it's in the agriculture space, like Texas vineyards, um, we're also looking at another land development project in the crop space um, or multifamily. Our goal is always to find an asset class that provides some asset protection for our investors and can also still at the same time generate lucrative returns without them having to take on additional risk. So we're trying to get, you know, out there in front of these financial trends as the markets are transitioning and changing and moving. And as we know, we see a lot of risk in the financial markets and have for a long time. So we're looking at hard assets primarily. Absolutely. Love to hear that. I mean, there's a lot of volatility in the markets right now, stock market. I mean, if you look at it today, it's down. I mean, I don't know how much in the last month, crypto the same, you know, these are all kind of risky, volatile um, types of things to be in. So, you know, 
even myself, big bull on multifamily. It's had a great run these last, you know, five, 10 years, or whatever. So you guys have been right in the thick of that well positioned. I do want to mention some of the, you know, talk about maybe some of the markets you're in from the multifamily. Cause you know, we hear a lot about these big markets, maybe you're somewhere in Florida or somewhere in Texas, whether it be in Austin or Dallas, but you guys have kind of taken another step in that. Can you talk a little about some of the markets you've targeted in terms of multifamily? Yeah, we, we love the tertiary markets in Texas. We live in Texas. I'm never allowed to leave Texas. I'm a seventh <laughs> generation Texan. So my dad's like, we're here to stay um, and we're investing in Texas. So, you know, we, I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area, but you and I both know we can't give our investors the returns that most investors are looking for. It's very challenging and very competitive in this market. So we figured let's start looking at other markets that have, you know, really great population growth, have really solid employment sectors and diversification of employment, has great rent growth. And so we really narrowed in on uh, West Texas, a little bit Northwest, but Lubbock to be, uh, to be exact where Texas Tech University is. And a lot of people aren't really aware of how great, well, they do now. They know now our secret's out. There's a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> looking in Lubbock now, but it's a great market and it's got great employment. And uh, we've done well there. We just sold one of our um, properties, 173 unit. We closed three weeks ago and uh, did really well for our investors. So they're happy and they love it too. Love to hear that. Congratulations on the sale too. I think that's awesome yeah. going full cycle on the deal. And I got to tell you, I think we were talking a little bit about a little bit before the show. I travel through that area up and down that, uh, the highway through uh, Amarillo and Lubbock all through there about every two weeks. And I got to tell you, you're absolutely spot on just from seeing the kind of growth that's happened in Lubbock and Amarillo over the past I don't know, two, three years. I mean, I know you guys go back even farther than that, but just to see what's going on, even now, it's pretty impressive. And, you know, I wouldn't have really thought that unless I've gone through that area, right? Kind of like you're saying, you know, a lot of people focus on Dallas or Houston or Austin, but these these West Texas markets, there's a lot there. And, you know, even if you go further south than that, and I know it's a bit of an oil play because it's all in gas in Midland, but Apartments are springing up all over Midland right now. So uh, I love the yeah. fact that you guys are in those tertiary markets. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, there could be a lot of potential, but like you said, it's getting more and more popular as we, uh, as we move forward in this cycle. Yeah. So love to, love to hear that. And it's, you know, it's great for investors. Um, it's just, it becomes harder for us on the acquisition side, which is not their problem, right? <laughs> it's sure. our problem to find another opportunity for them, but it is, it is a solid market. And the other thing that's happening around uh, Texas Tech University is there's a lot of dorms that have been shut down for construction. So it's pushing mm -hmm. a lot of the upper classmen. Um, we're four, you know, we typically stay about four miles away from campus. We're near a really nice part of town with like the big, the city's largest mall and restaurant area, but it's pushing a lot of the upper classmen towards our properties, which we love because parents are signing on the lease and we know that rent's going to get paid. <laughs> so there's a lot of great stuff happening there. There's not a lot of planned new development either. So that's really helping our rent growth. Yeah. Love to hear that. You sounds like you guys have really locked down your strategy in terms of multifamily, you know, getting in there in those tertiary markets. I love that space. And, you know, you guys are participating uh, in, in great areas, you, but you're also participating in a very interesting niche other than multifamily, right? Uh, I think we mentioned a little bit of, about it in your bio there, but that's being vineyards. So how and when were you first introduced to the idea of vineyards as an investment? It's been about two, two and a half years since okay. we started underwriting it. You know, we, we syndicated our first block of vineyards last year. That was uh, 445 acres um, is what we purchased. We're planting about 300 acres of that um, now, but yeah, it started about two and a half years ago. And before that, my dad had always wanted to put acre like vineyards, some acreage on the family ranch, maybe like three, four acres, not a lot just obviously to make the land payment. That's why people run cattle here in Texas. Sure. It's not because it's a huge profitable operation. It's just make the land payment. And he saw that vineyards were pretty lucrative. And he mentioned that on a podcast and um, this guy named Mason Moreland, which, you know, we love Mason reached out to us and said, Hey, I, we need to talk. And he'd been wanting to expand their operation and um, just wanted to partner with us to do that. And so we did a lot of underwriting, spent about a year and a half of, of doing that. And Put together the investment, and uh, I just got pictures of the vines that are 230,000 vines that are sitting in a nursery Ooh. in California. They're going to get shipped here and go in the ground, and we're about to start the uh, the next block and purchase another probably 600 acres this year. Wow! So yes, it's been very exciting. I love this project. Um, it's been fun. 
Yeah, yeah it's fun. a super it's a super interesting niche, right? You don't hear I mean, we don't hear about it much. And so, you know, uh, I met Mason before, great guy and even connecting with you. So you guys being uh, connected is, is awesome. Right. But, uh, you know, you it seems like you you and your partners really identified uh, like a, a, an opportunity or a void or a gap in the marketplace. Right. With this this Texas, these Texas vineyards and producing, you know, the grapes for the wine. Can you talk about, you know, why that gap is there or maybe what created yeah. that gap and some of the challenges associated with that? Absolutely. Um, and I'll zoom out for just a second. Cause a lot of people think like Texas wine, what? And they don't understand <laughs> how big the industry is here. And Texas is the fifth largest wine grape growing state in the United States um, and continues to grow. The economic impact of the wine industry here is a little over 13 billion billion with a B. So it's a big, a big industry. The challenge is as the wine demand continues to grow here, the grape supply cannot keep up. So you've got a lot of just old school Texas farmers here um, that have, have not transitioned to a modern type of technology and way of managing a vineyard, which is how California manages their vineyards. Everything is mechanized. And in Texas, we've still got, you know, there's a hundred people out in a vineyard, you know, pruning the vines and harvesting. And so it's a lot of hand labor and that hand labor creates, you know, very tight profit margins. And so they can't really lower the price of their grapes. Wineries really want to make all their, you know, hundred percent Texas wine, but they can't. So the current stats are Texas is only producing about 50% of the grapes that are actually needed based on the continually growing wine demand. And so we're shipping in trucks from California. Listen, if you're from California, <laughs> we love your, it's a beautiful state, but if you any, know anybody from Texas, or if I'm the first Texan you've met, we're really obnoxious about Texas. And so <laughs> Texans don't like the idea that there's California juice mixed in with their Texas wine. And even like the legislation of this, you can't even title it a Texas wine unless 75% of the grapes are from here, which is even hard to achieve right now. Okay. So 95% of our wine is consumed in state. So Texans want Texas wine and these wineries want Texas grapes. So nobody else is going to do this because to even kind of, you can't really dip your toe in the water. Let me try it out. Just to try it out is about a $7 million operation to get the equipment. And it, it has to be done at scale, right? It's like you do Daniel with large apartment complexes. We do things. We got to find that sweet spot. Where's the economies of scale come into play. And in the vineyards, it's at least 300 acres and it's about a $7 million project because one of our, one of our pieces of equipment is 550 grand. Wow. So yeah, there, there's this hole in the market and we're filling it and there's nobody else doing it. And California is not coming in to do it because they don't know the land here. So it's just been a very exciting project that has attracted a lot of investor interest. And um, it's exciting. It's, I love multifamily, but this has been, this has been really exciting. Yeah. And there's just something that really attractive about this type of this type of thing, right? Whether you're, whether you like wine or you don't, you know, maybe this is just something like a passion play or whatever, but I think it's very interesting. And I, and I love to hear this. So I kind of want to dive into that a little bit more. And I, and thank you for, you know, diving into the, the, the supply and demand gap and, and kind of feeling that need. But uh, I want to walk through maybe the business plan y'all have in place regarding the vineyards and how that applies on the investment side. Can you talk about that for a little bit? Yes. In terms of operations or sure just, sure. just like from beginning in, you guys, are you guys buying a piece of land yeah. and then just going from there? And then what does it look like on the back end? When, yeah, uh, if there is an exit. Yeah. You know, it's funny. That's one of the biggest questions that we get from investors because they don't want, they don't want an exit because these vineyards are so lucrative. <laughs> they want the cash flow. That's one of the things that attracts a lot of people to it is that it's 25 plus years A vineyard. We plant once it's going to yield a lot of fruit for 25 years. And then we've got contingency uh, funds in place to start replanting that vineyard as the yields typically start to drop around year 22 to 25. And mm -hmm. so we'll start replanting the vineyard and it'll continue on for another 25 years. So it's a great investment from a legacy standpoint that a lot of investors are looking at for their kids. Um, but yeah, we are buying raw land. So we're buying land and you've been out to that area a whole lot out in La Mesa. It's called the High Plains AVA, which stands for American Viticultural Area. It sits on top of an aquifer, but it's the prime grape growing area in Texas. And so we buy uh, 445 acres is what we purchased last year. Uh, we're tilling up the land, prepping the land, uh, irrigating it. We're putting in eight wells and these eight, eight wells, which I think you would appreciate because you know, you know, <laughs> gallons per minute, right. And what's important, but we're pumping about 800 gallons per minute wow. on each of these wells, um, to the vineyard. And so those vines go in the ground and it takes about four years to get to a harvest that we're willing to sell. 
to wineries. So there, there's definitely a, a waiting period. But once you get to your fifth year harvest, um, our vines will be pushing 12 to 15 tons of grapes per acre. And just for perspective, the average vineyard in Texas is only doing about two to three tons per acre. So wow. once we hit year five, um, it's a party. And uh, <laughs> from year five to 25, you know, we're just every year we're growing, we're harvesting grapes, we're crushing those grapes and we're selling them to the wineries. So that's where the money's really made in Texas, the opportunity. Um, we don't plan to get into the, the making of wine. We just want to grow the wine grapes, um, have a really good quality grape, great relationship with big wineries, sell the grapes and do it again the next year. Yeah, I think it's fantastic. Fantastic. And it's a great model, right? And especially, you know, if you're able to provide, uh, you know, returns to your investors, even if it is a longer hold, I mean, there's a, there's a place for that, right? For that longer hold. And I think a lot of people can be, can be, you know, satisfied with that because they're not having to turn their money every two years or three years or whatever, right? They can keep it in there, yeah. get the cash flow and have basically some sort of infinite returns at some point. So I'd love to hear that. Um, you know, I kind of want to dive into something, nothing, nothing too deep, but I do want to kind of go over the underwriting a little bit. You know, most of our, most of our listeners, are passive investors, right? So they're not pro professional underwriters. I'm not a professional underwriter, right? But, uh, you know, some of us like to do a little deeper dive into under underwriting than others. But uh, so, you know, we might be familiar with multifamily or self-storage. How does underwriting for a vineyard business differ from assets such as multifamily? Or is it the same? Can you speak on that? <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, it's funny because there's a lot of similarities, but there are a lot of differences because a lot of what plays into this is science, um, sure. you know, the growing of grapes and there's so much science that's involved. So the biggest factor that impacts our ability to generate revenue, because like in multifamily, we need to make sure are we in a solid market that's got solid population uh, growth that has employment sectors where we know we can increase the rents. The biggest factor that determines our income in the vineyards is the price that we can sell our grapes. Hmm. And so our underwriting is typically based somewhere between 1400 to about 15 to $1,600 per ton for grapes. So that much per ton per grapes times, you know, 12 to 15 tons an acre, we should bring in a little over 5 million every year just from harvest. So that price point, we base it on historical grape prices in Texas and historical prices for grapes have been above $1,400 a ton for more than 13 years. Wow. They're trending around 1850 for red grapes right now. So we're very conservative in our approach in terms of the price point that we're going to be able to sell our grapes at. The other thing that's unique about this investment compared to multifamily, uh, people always think, well, what about weather related events? Because we're in Texas, right? We get hail, we get we get all Absolutely. kinds of crazy weather, yeah. especially out in that area. And um, we have crop insurance, so not all vineyards have crop insurance, but we have factor that into our underwriting because we want to make sure that our returns are covered. So we're paying once we hit full harvest around our fourth and fifth year, we're going to be paying about six hundred thousand dollars a year in insurance premiums. What that means is that if something happened and wiped out our vineyard, we can still pay our investors what they thought their returns would be because we'll get a big insurance check. So that's that's been really important for us. We would not go into this without crop insurance. And I think sure. it makes our investors feel a lot better about um, just, you know, the investment, the investment in general. The other thing that's unique is, you know, most multifamily projects that we do is non-recourse debt. In this space, it is recourse. Um, it is not recourse for investors. It is recourse for myself, <laughs> for my dad, for Mason, um, for his partners. So we're, you know, investors want to know, do you have skin in the game? Yeah, we've got millions in the game. We've signed our name on millions of dollars in loans because we believe in this so much. So those are some of the key differences in underwriting. It's just making sure that you've got, um, well, here's another big one, just the cost of materials. Mm -hmm. We know as material costs are going up, um, some of the big purchases in our, um, our arena is um, T-Post and steel. So an interesting phone call, <laughs> Mason called American Steel, told him, he said, I need to, you know, get some quotes. This was, you know, a year and a half ago. I need to get some quotes on, uh, on some T-Post. And they're like, you need to call it, you know, he said, what's it for? And he's like, oh, it's for a vineyard. He was like, you need to call a tractor supply. <laughs> Mason's like, I don't think you understand. He's like, I need 230,000 T-Post. <laughs> and the guy was like, oh, Okay. <laughs> you know, like it's a huge order of metal, like 44, 18 wheelers worth is what we've had delivered of T-Post coming in wow. for this project. And so, you know, we are very conservative in our underwriting. We assume that costs would go up about 75% from where we first started. And we've come in under budget. Um, I, we checked yesterday, we're under a few thousand dollars under budget on everything. Going into our next block, we've assumed that prices will continue to climb another 75%. Wow. 
we don't think that's going to happen, but we've got that hedge in there. So we've got a lot of hedges in place in terms of interest rates for a refi in year eight, in terms of our materials. So just like we're conservative in multifamily, we are extremely conservative here. So our investors know that going into it, there's you know, there's nothing to worry about. We've we've planned for everything that could potentially happen, even a hailstorm. That's been planned for too. <laughs> so well, we both we both know that could definitely happen out there. I mean, uh, spending any time out there, you know, the, like you said before, the weather is absolutely uh, crazy at times. So love to hear that, and I appreciate you diving into that because I know uh, for me as a passive investor, I always want to know, you know, how conservative is the underwriting? What you know, if there's any risks in this type of deal, how are they being mitigated? So going over that, I really appreciate that. And if the passive investors are listening right now, I know they'll be very very appreciative of knowing, you know, kind of the back end of that. So thank you for that. Um, one thing I kind of want to dive into is, you know, we don't really want to talk about, you know, returns on the show, stuff like that. But, you know, with a multifamily passive investment, you typically see investor benefits such as cash flow appreciation, tax advantages, others. We're familiar with this stuff. Uh, are these the same kind of benefits you see with, uh, with a vineyard? I mean, I know we're not talking about buildings and all this stuff, but you still have infrastructure, whatnot. Uh, can you dive into that just a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the total return that we're looking at for investors over 10 years, depending on where we sell the great prices and our material costs and all that, we should come in between a 3X and a 4X on their money over 10 years. Wow. But the infinite return comes into play is after that 10 years, I mean, well, they it's actually after year eight because they get all their money back in the refi. So after year eight, it's going to continue to cash flow about 15 to 22% a year for 25 years. And then we've got by year 20, about a five and a half million dollar contingency contingency fund to keep replanting. So there's, it's very lucrative, which I believe is why investors are like, Hey, we're willing to wait five years you know, to get, um, to get to that point. So there are a lot of similarities there. The other interesting thing is that cost segregation applies here. I mean, we use mm-hmm. the same cost seg firm that we use for multifamily. There's, we can actually depreciate the aquifer that the vineyard wow. sits on top of. So there's a lot of tax benefits. There's operational losses that get, are able to pass through to our investors for the first four years before we're actually selling grapes and bringing in a bunch of income. So there's, yes, there are tax advantages there as well. Yeah. Love to hear that. And that, that's very interesting about the aquifer. I would not have guessed that. So that's, yeah. uh, I, I love to hear that. That's very interesting. Uh, Keely. So um, one more thing before we get out of here, I know I want to be respectful of your time here. Uh, one thing, uh, one of the things I know about passive investing in syndications is that it's very important to ensure that the investment aligns with the investor's strategy, risk profile, all that kind of stuff. Right. So, so when it boils down to it, you know, most of these paths, or I say some of these passive investments, there aren't for everybody, right? I mean, passive investing just, it just isn't for everybody. So, you know, the vineyard strategy, very interesting. So I'm curious, what kind of investors should be investing in vineyards? And then maybe on the other hand, what kind of investors should maybe not be investing in vineyards? I love that question because it's so true. Um, you know, you, you can see us and like shiny object syndrome. Like, oh, I want to put my money in that. It's like, yeah, but really what's your own personal profile of where you need your money to work for you? And when do you need the money back? And this is certainly an investment for, I would say investors who have other cash flowing investments that are producing some cash flow sooner than five years, because this is literally put your money in and wait, and you're going to get some tax benefits and all that, you know, cost seg and all that's going to flow through depreciation, but you're not getting a return on this until year five. There's a small return in year four, but really the return that you want, that's going to be above 35% doesn't come in until year five. So it's, it's going to be for the investor that's fine waiting Um, I would also say that it's for the investor that has that kind of long-term perspective. I was talking to an investor uh, two days ago, and that was his frustration. He said, I love my multifamily projects, but some of them are turning before the five or six year mark. And now I'm like, what do I do with this money? So it's, um, it's a great, a great investment from, from that perspective to just put your money in there, um, let it grow. The other thing that I will caution every investor of something to think about, which we spend a lot of time doing tax strategizing with the CPA and with a cost seg um, expert is realizing that the return, it's not a quarterly distribution. We sell, we harvest the grapes and typically August, September, October, depending on the rain in that season, we sell the grapes. We start getting the grapes on trucks and headed to the wineries. And so the distribution every year happens in November. Mm. So once we're at year five harvest, year six or seven, and you're getting a big chunk of money, it's coming in at the end of the year. So if you're trying to figure <laughs> out, I don't want to pay taxes on this, you got to be strategizing ahead earlier in the year. And so we're, we're very cautious about that and letting our investors know, here's what we're projecting in terms of, you know, the income that's going to come in this year. So you can be thinking about, be thinking about in January, 
what type of, you know, investments could offset this big chunk of money that's coming in at the end of the year. So those are some of the things to be aware of. Sure. I, you know what? I, I feel like I could just keep asking you questions pretty much all day about this because it's so interesting and I keep learning more and more every time you speak. So, but you know, I, like I said, I want to be respectful of your time. It's been a great conversation before we get out of here, Keely, uh, tell us more about what you have going on, whether it's, you know, Hubbard capital or personal life, whatever, just lay it on us. Yeah, no, I've, I've enjoyed, I've really enjoyed um, being on this podcast. I, I love y'all's podcast. I think it's <laughs> incredible. So thank you for having me. We are, um, we actually just did two educational webinars on the vineyards. So where you get to see uh, Mason speaking, uh, I'm on there, my dad's on there, but it's like, you know, a couple hours of all the science behind it and how it works. So if you want to learn more about that, just reach out to us through our website. It's just hubbardcapitalgroup.com. And that's the best, the best place to connect. We're rolling into a, uh, another raise soon with uh, getting 600 acres purchased this year. And so we're off to the races again. So that's what's happening over, over on my end. Awesome. Love to hear it, Keely. We're going to make sure to put that uh, the website in the, in the show notes so people can reach out. I know I'm definitely going to dive into that webinar myself because I'm uh, super interested. So uh, looking forward to it. Keely, it's been great. Thank you again for uh, coming on the show today. You bet. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for listening to today's episode. Head over to iTunes to subscribe to the show. And while you're there, we really appreciate you leaving a rating and written review. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to hear on the show, connect with us on social media or through our website at twosmartassets.com. We look forward to speaking to each and every one of you. Talk to you soon.